This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Into the far corner, Matto swoops in to intercept. Matto behind the net, swings it in front, right. he's down! Going back to May 27th, 1994, inside Madison Square Garden, the one of the greatest venues ever, and really, it's got a lot of its mystique because of what was going on around this time in New York. This is a very, very busy time for sports fans in New York, and a very successful time as well, but no game really resonated like the New York Rangers, New Jersey Devils, 1994 Eastern Conference Finals Game 7. That's what we're doing today on Distant Replay. I'm Ben George. He's Mike Noto. And Mike, this is absolutely right in your wheelhouse. So I'm going to lean on you quite a bit this episode. Hey, Ben, look, a large reason why I'm a huge sports fan is because of this era in New York sports. And this Rangers run, and in particular this game, is a big part of that. It was a great game. And we're going to go back and watch it as it aired in 1994 on ESPN back when ESPN still had NHL rights, carrying the playoffs, a great crew uh, had this game as well. So we're going to take you all the way through it, but we're going to go through a lot through the lead up to this game because uh, that's the biggest part of this game is what's happening in New York, in this area, in the Northeast, with with the Rangers being as good as they were, the the Devils kind of emerging with a young goaltender in that that was uh, turned out to be one of the greatest of all time. And we found out a lot about him in this series. But we're going to go through that all tonight and a lot of outdated stuff, too, to talk about as well. Remember, you can find us online, distantreplaypodcast.com. I'm going to put this game up there so you can go back and watch it as it aired on ESPN. Tremendous game. Recommend you go back and watch it. But also connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And let us know if there's a game you want us to go back and watch. We, uh, We always put them on our list. And I don't know if this one was a recommendation, Mike. I don't think it was. But this is one we've had on our list. It's like when we go hockey... This is one that I think ranked pretty high for us. Yeah, for me, this is, you know, n- number one hockey game that I've seen in my lifetime. One of the best series ever, too. I mean, if you look at some of the lists of the best series in NHL history, this series is always on it. And this game being game seven of that series, I think, was a natural pick for us. And just in advance, so apologize for the Rangers fans. We mentioned we're doing the ESPN broadcast. I could not find the MSG broadcast with Sam Rosen and John Davidson. I know Rangers fans will would rather watch that one or hear about that one, but I cannot find it anywhere on YouTube. So I have to give that disclaimer to Rangers fans. They'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but nonetheless, like Ben said, we'll get to in a second here. ESPN did a great job with hockey overall and this broadcast. I'm glad you said that because you know New York fans are a different breed, obviously, but you also have a bigger market and more options as well. Like most, most uh, towns aren't going to, now it's different. Obviously there's networks everywhere, but you know, back then MSG was still ahead of the game in terms of you had your own hometown announcers. You had the option to watch them, but also watch the national feed as well. Like I think most people that aren't from New York or that area wouldn't even realize that was an option back then. Yeah. Look, it's in this unique situation. Like Ben said, you have MSG network, not only has the Rangers games during this time, right, but they also have the Knicks. So you have both these teams on this local, you know, now these local uh, city-specific sports channels are very common. In fact, New York has three of them now, okay? Mm -hmm. But back then, you know, MSG Network was one of the only ones that I knew of. And, look, I had uh, Sam and JD with the Rangers and John Andres and Marv Albert with the Knicks. You know, (laughs) that's like basically, you know, again, huge reason why I'm a big sports fan. Now, when I think about this game, I, I don't know where you were, Mike, when this one aired. I'll, I'll let you tell me in a second. But I'm pretty sure that I still, to this day, when I when I think about like sports moments and I think about the garden, I'm pretty sure you're the one that told me, like when we were back, this was probably 10 years ago you told me this, back when we were you know in Connecticut working together. But I think you're the one that told me the loudest you've ever heard Madison Square Garden, the loudest it's ever been was this game. And I think I, I specifically remember when you tell me like people at like Penn station, like underneath in the subway 
it was like shaking and stuff. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Great memory. Okay. So this is the most, th- this whole playoff run, but in particularly this series and this game is the loudest I've personally ever heard Madison Square Garden. And what you're thinking about, Ben, you have a great memory is my father used to work in Penn Station. Okay. And had his office in Penn Station and work nights. Okay. So during the games, when there was a big play and how cr- crazy the crowd went, if you've ever been to Penn Station, it's right below Madison Square Garden, right? Literally his office would shake with, with how crazy everyone was going during his games. Yeah, that's okay. So he worked during a lot of the playoff games, and that's where – that's probably what I had told you. Okay, um, yeah. and, and if you talk to anyone who was around the Garden at that time, uh, they'll, they'll tell you some similar stories. Just a great time to be a sports fan in New York. Yeah, and you get a sense of that from the game, and, and the broadcast points it out immediately. But let's talk right. Let's talk, start off with what's going on in New York right now, because this is obviously a, a big series. Anytime you can get, uh, explain the rivalry to me. I was going to call it a rivalry, but I guess before I even do that, tell me if this is a rivalry or not. Devils Rangers. Um, it certainly um, has blossomed into a rivalry. It certainly always was like a big brother, little brother kind of thing. Um, remember, there's a third hockey team in the New York area, the New York <laughs> Islanders. So if there's a if there's a nat- more natural rival for the Rangers, it's the Islanders. But during this time period, you had the Devils sort of making noise, and you couldn't ignore the Devils at this time. Unfortunately for the Devils, there isn't many Devils fans. The Devils <laughs> are not a super popular team. I think it was at, at a point where, you know, like the Nets are really good this year. Right. And <laughs> – they're more of a Nash. They're more of a story nationally than they are in New York right now, because yeah. the that, Knicks are having a, a totally unexpected good season, not as good as the Nets, right? Well, it's funny because you, you know, even like about a this. We're taping this in April of of twenty twenty or May of twenty twenty one, towards the end, getting close to the playoffs, NBA. But even like earlier in the year, I remember I was on a Zoom call with our our good friend Yao. Probably heard a lot of the stuff he's done. Like he's a great rapper lyricist and he's done a lot of uh a lot of lead-ins to big sporting events but he he was he's a huge Knicks fan like yourself but he was even telling me earlier in the year when the Knicks were like okay but not where they are now eight games over and you know actually people are getting excited for like legitimately um he was even saying like even then like the Nets are like back page like not like their second page behind the Knicks even with with how good they were playing and all the talent they have they're still the second story despite how loaded that roster is yeah like Outside of, well, again, a little off track here, but outside of like Harden when he first came and like fitting into the team being a main storyline, outside of that, you know, the Nets have been second fiddle to the Knicks, even though the Nets are a better team. Yeah. And that's what you had sort of developing right now with the Devils and Rangers. So right now, the Rangers are the better team. The Rangers won the President's Trophy for most points during the regular season, right? But the Devils are emerging. And in subsequent years and in the future, the Devils would be that amazing organization, amazing players, amazing announcer, but hmm. still second rate to the Rangers who were not as good of a team from pretty much from after this season forward. The Devils had an extraordinary run here, Ben. Again, I mean, you had this is when I got introduced to rookie goaltender Martin Brodeur, who would become an obviously an NHL legend. You start to see Lou Lamarillo in a, def- de- in a different light here. He's the GM of the Devils, was the GM for the Devils for almost 20 years, okay? And, oh, sorry, for over 20 years, for almost 30 years, he was the GM of the Devils. His strategy on how to put teams together to fit a certain playing style, again, would go down in NHL history. And then this is when I got introduced to Doc Emmerich as well. So, Ben, I'm not sure if you're aware – but Doc Emmerich was the play. He's obviously become a national play-by-play guy. Yeah. But he was the play-by-play guy locally for the Devils. So um, this is very much the Devils sort of bursting on the scene this season. And they had a lot of other good players as well. I mean, Scott Stevens, Claude Lemieux, Bobby Holik. Uh, these are names that, if you're a Rangers fan, uh, they haunt you. You know, I didn't realize, you know, going back and researching the Devils, I guess I just didn't realize how young the, the franchise was at this point. What they're only what twelve years old when this game was played, so I remember because I grew up in New Jersey. As you guys who listen to this podcast, you know, I remember they were founded right around my birthday, yeah. give or take. So it was probably eighty one or eighty two. Am I right on that? Yeah, first season was eighty two, eighty three. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so they they don't have a long history. Never been to the Stanley Cup final at this point. Uh, not a surprise. Only been around twelve years, but they had been to a few, a couple of conference finals. So they've been close. They've been knocking on the door a little bit. And um, 
they were on the verge at this point here again. So that kind of sets the stage with those two teams. But also in New York right now, I mentioned the Knicks, but in the middle of this series, you also have the Knicks in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Pacers. Yep, you have the Knicks in the Eastern Conference Final against the, uh, it was like I said, an unbelievable time. The Knicks right now at this point are in the middle of their Eastern Conference Final series against the Pacers and would square off against the Pacers in a game 7 on June 5th, just a couple of weeks after this game. So, hmm. uh, you know, this is also the year where I was moving on a personal level from New Jersey to Connecticut with my family. And I remember thinking, man, what a time to move. Like, I'm moving when all my teams are awesome, you know, <laughs> except for the Mets, obviously. But, um, you know, and it was just, a, you know, a great time to be a New York sports fan. Yeah, think about that. Two Game 7 Eastern Conference Finals in Madison Square Garden about 10 days apart. So pretty pretty amazing. We have the first one here with hockey first up. So let's talk a little bit about these two teams too, Mike. I mean, you know, we, we kind of gave a little bit of background on them, but – Kind of set the stage with this 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 series too, and kind of where we are because you know we're at Game Seven. Obviously, a lot happens to get to Game Seven, but I think what the lead up to this game I think is at, is as important as what happens in this Game Seven, right? It, it, absolutely. So let's put it this way: during this Rangers playoff run, the two players that gave Rangers fans chills every time you saw them were Martin Brodeur, okay, because of this because of his performance in the first six games. So remember, the Devils were up 3-2 to two in the series, okay? And at that point, you have that feeling like, man, this team, the Rangers, they won the President's Trophy. They haven't been to a, won a Stanley Cup since 1940. If we're not going to win it with this team and we're going to get beat by a rookie goaltender, never mind the Devils, like what is going on here? It was a real sense of nervousness, right? And then that's when Marc Messier issued his famous guarantee that they would win game six. Delivers mm-hmm. in Game 6 with the game-winning goal, and that's the lead-in to Game 7. So it's an absolutely raucous Madison Square Garden setting the scene. Um, the Rangers, again, Mike Keenan, battle-tested coach. Their roster, loaded. This was a loaded, loaded team. I think people think Mark Messier when they think this team. But remember, Brian Leach won the Smythe Trophy this season. That's for the MVP of the playoffs. You had Adam Graves, who had a great season. Names like Alexei Kovalev, Craig McTavish, Mike Richter in goal, obviously. I mean, I could go on and on. Asa in just a, a very, very well-put-together team by the front office of the Rangers. And you just had that feeling that, just like you did in the Stanley Cup Finals with, uh, do you know the name Pavel Bure, Ben? Oh, yeah. Just like him. I mean, he wasn't a goaltender like Brodeur, but those two guys, Brodeur and Bure, Send chills up your spine. The only thing you were nervous about heading into this game seven is if Brodor stands on his head, is, is there much the Rangers can do? Um, but in the back of your mind, you were like, man, they're the best team. They got to figure out a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, Messier, not only did he score that game winner, they were down 2 1 going into the third period, and he scored a hot, hat trick in the third period after, after guaranteeing a victory. I mean, I don't know of many more epic, um, <laughs> epic performances than that to guarantee a win and then go out and have a hat trick in the third period to win the game. That's, that is ridiculous, but that's why that's, that's part of Megacy's Messier's legacy and why he was so great. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned Brodeur being a rookie the guy was only 21 years old in this game. And I, I guess Mike, I mean, I know I knew Richter and I'm, and I think a lot of these guys I remembered from playing like video games, probably more than watching actual hockey back then, because it's like Sega Genesis, uh, NHL hockey was, I loved it. It was awesome. I played a lot of that. So I recognize a lot of these names from that too, but I guess in this series, though, Richter was the bigger name, right? I mean, in terms of goalies. Now I know what Brodeur had done throughout this, this series and leading up to this point, but as you mentioned, he's still a rookie. So in retrospect, now we look back and say, well, Brodeur was the better, is the better goalie over the course of a career. But this time Richter was the guy, right? Yeah. Richter, Richter had a great season, great playoff run. Uh, he had played great in this game, as we'll get to. Played great in the Stanley Cup Finals also against the Canucks. Um, yeah, Richter was, you know, Brodor would become Brodor, you know, um, and be one of the all-time greats, but but Richter was no slouch. He was great. And you remember, you said you remember a lot of these this playoffs almost completely, right? So I was looking back through how the how the Rangers got here because they, you know, they had the best season, but just how good they were. They opened up with the Islanders, swept the Islanders, and – won the first two games six nothing <laughs> in the last two games five one five two so I mean they were playing above their head and then and then this the second round 
wasn't much different. The Capitals, they won, Capitals won one game, but otherwise the Rangers pretty much cruised. And you had uh, Richter now four four uh, shutouts in the playoffs coming into this game seven. Yeah, they, I remember them only losing one game the first two rounds, but I forgot how the series played out. I didn't know if it was if they swept the Capitals or they swept the Islanders, but yeah, they swept go. the Islanders. They were three nothing against the Capitol, Capitals, and the Capitals won um, to send it to a game five. So wasn't wasn't a very stressful series or playoffs up to this point for them. But we get to this game. And what else, Mike, about this this game? Do we need to set the stage with? I think I think we said it. I think we said it well. Now remember one other thing. The Devils are in this in this series had already won two games at the Garden, so we're not in a situation here where you think them winning this game is impossible. So yeah, yeah, the Devils won the first game in two overtimes. Game three was a double overtime win for the Rangers, <laughs> and then the Devils won games four and five. So as you mentioned, you know Messi had to make that guarantee, but backs are against the wall, and you're heading in there uh, to Game Seven with a crowd that is ready. And I don't remember, in the games that we've watched at least over the course of this podcast, I don't remember a lot of games we've gone into. And at the top of the broadcast, all that the announcers were talking about was the crowd. Yeah, the crowd's going crazy from like literally the first second of the game. It fe- I think it fed the Rangers early because they were very aggressive early and oh, Bordeaux yeah. made some great saves. Um, what did you think of the Rangers fans reacting to all of the action on the ice? Like the missed shots or the missed passes or the big oh, it hits, great, it was great, and you could you could you could hear it pretty well on this broadcast. Um, I, I I thought it was funny because they come in, they're like, you know, just had a, like a, a rousing rendition of the national anthem. The crowd was just singing to, which I could just picture, you know, these these New Yorkers just just belting out the national anthem, and then they said they had just fired up like New York, New York, right before. The first puck dropped. I mean, was that is that is that like a tradition, or was that just in the moment? Let's get this. Let's keep this this crowd lathered up. I don't know that it's a tradition, but Rangers fans, Ben. I know you said you've been to a Rangers game, and I don't know what your opinion was. I'm not just saying it because I'm a Rangers fans, Rangers fan, but I think when people think New York sports fans, I don't know if the Rangers are the first thing that comes to mind for like the national audience. Mm-hmm. But if you're a New York sports fan, well known that Rangers fans are pretty much the most passionate fans out there. Really, yeah. More than like I'm Knicks. talking at at the game, passionate. Okay. Like every like most people are plugged in. Most people are there to watch the hockey game. Like you know, I mean, the New York sports fan I think is known for being pretty educated on sports anyway. But Rangers fans kind of take it to another level. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to get to your question, like y- you see it from the from the jump in this game, um, which is on ESPN. Yet Gary Thorne. Now go through the hockey the broadcast crew because. You you when I when I asked you ahead of time, hey, who were all the three guys on this broadcast again? You made it sound like I didn't know who Vin Scully was or something. Yeah, no, because <laughs> look, ESPN, like I, I I don't know what happened with the contractual stuff with ESPN and hockey, but their their hockey broadcast, who I remember is Gary Thorne, okay, on the on the play by play, Bill Clement as an analyst, and Al Morganti as the uh, the sideline guy. Um, those three were like that's who I think of when I think of ESPN hockey. Mm-hmm. Um, again, they were good. A lot of national announcers, let's face it, are not that great, right? They're maybe, they have a tough time. When you're watching them as a local fan, you're like, man, these guys know nothing about my team, right? Mm-hmm. But these guys did an excellent job, in my opinion. And I guess Doc Doc's kind of rise nationally, at least, kind of was right, it's concurrent with ESPN losing the rights probably, right? When he joined ES- yeah. NBC, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Kind of replaced remember, Gary Thorne for like the national voice. Then we go to then we go to um, NBC, and it's like you know a more New York based company. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and Doc Emmerich's right there. You can't ignore Doc Emmerich. He's on TV every night if you're sitting down <laughs> watching hockey. Uh, he's he's a great announcer. I don't like the Devils, but Doc Emmerich is a great announcer. He yeah. retired recently, but he's great. Yeah, uh, he was awesome to watch. All right, so first period in this game, Mike. Uh, I, the thing that I, to your point, picked up on the most was that the Rangers just seemed to be in full-on attack mode. They seemed to have the, the puck down on the devil's end the entire time, and Brodeur was just lights out early. Yeah, he was great. And uh, the Devils had an opportunity, too, on a two-on-one that just missed. Um, this is about as most even, uh, even of a first period as you can get, Ben. It's 0-0 at the end of the first period. It's 11 to 10 on shots taken in favor of the Rangers, and there's no penalties. 
Mm-hmm. About as even as it gets as we head into the second period. And it was uh, well. The other thing that I noticed too is it was just so physical. And I don't know, like I don't, I don't watch hockey on a nightly basis or even a, a weekly basis, right? I'll, I'll check in in the playoffs. I'll watch, I'll watch the playoffs of any sport. So I kind of familiar there. But I just, and I know that across all sports, you know, in twenty twenty one, every they've made a conscious effort to protect players and you know pay more attention to the health of of players maybe not as much in the nhl because we've got uh, a current you know little uh drama brewing with the rangers right now as we record this but it just seemed to me like this this game was super physical and guys were getting like, kind of knocked all over the ice in this one yeah just a just a i mean this is the you know i know it's cliche but it's game seven you know the six games of these guys just being in each other's faces you know a lot of aggression a lot of hey this is it you know, and uh, the, that's why the, that's why everyone loves Game Seven in, in, in a Stanley Cup Final. You know, or, sorry, in a Stanley Cup playoff series. Um, and hey, look, one thing I thought was shocking in the second period, right? Did you hear when Gary Thorne said that Slava Fatisov, who was a legendary player, legendary Russian player, that they were asking would he become the first Russian to have his name on the Stanley Cup? That no I Russian up to this that. point. No Russian up to this point had his name on the Stanley Cup. How is that even possible? I don't know. But they were saying, like, it was definitely going to happen this year because, you know, there was Russians, I think, on every team left. But how how insane is that? Were they just – I mean, they were still as prevalent in the NHL, right, as they are now? I don't, I don't know if they were saying – I don't know. I don't know if they are getting to technicalities of, like, when – but Russia was still Russia at this point. Maybe they meant the old Soviet Union. I don't know. I don't know, I, but it made it sound like he was going to be the first. He he may be the first Russian to have his name on the Stanley Cup. That stood out to me. Like I couldn't believe that. Yeah, that's nuts. That's wild. I didn't. I did not hear that when they said it. But yeah, that's hard to believe. Second period, we finally get our first goal too, and we get we get our first goal and our first penalty. Which, um, again, to see a game, I love watching games when any sport where the play is clean in terms of, you know, not a ton of whistles. There's not a ton of fouls or penalties, whatever it is in the sport you're playing. And that was the case in this game. Like, I'd kind of re- realize it, but when they got to the second period and they got that first penalty, we're like first power play, I was like, man, we've got a long time with no penalties. That seems that seems like it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I, I made special note of that penalty, too. It was a trip on Messier. Yeah. The Rangers didn't take advantage of the, of the power play, but still, like you said, a clean game played. The goal you're, make, you're referencing to was by Brian Leach, a little spinorama goal. Beautiful. Which you did in NHL 94 back in the day plenty oh, of times, absolutely. I'm sure, Ben. <laughs> uh, that goal comes at 1029 in the second period. Leach at this point now has 23 points in 16 games in the playoffs. Okay. This is where I, this is where I give ESPN a lot of credit now. Right after that goal happens, they pan right to the 1940 championship banner. Yeah. Right? That's a sense of the moment right there. I love that. That's what you normally do not get from a national broadcast. Now you have the Rangers fans starting their Marty chant to hmm. Martin Brodeur. Clear as day. You know what they're saying. Uh, a save by Richter on a Lemieux breakaway. Then Brodeur comes right back with a great save. This is probably the most exciting sort of back and forth of the game here in the second period. Um, then you have the penalty that you talked about. And that even though the Rangers scored, right, both goalies were incredible in this period. You know, this is one of the games, one of the one of the things I like about hockey a lot when I watch these playoff games is you'll get some of these playoff and, and sure, you know, game seven, right? You know, very you know, stereotypical you know, uh, elements to the game seven. But what I love is like when you get a, a game like this where you have two goalies that are just, as you mentioned, you know, standing on their head, right? But you, it, it wasn't because of a lack of attack or offense. It was just because they were making every save possible. This game was this game played quick. I mean, there was a good pace to it. It was it was fun to watch. It wasn't like uh, a real drawn out, uh, you know, one nothing game after two periods. It was back and forth, and you were surprised by a number of opportunities that were not capitalized upon and that was all go to the goalies but there's nothing to me better than watching a game like this that's a zero zero game because of two great goaltenders i know i know a lot of people love scoring just in general in sports but to me to get a game like this is so much fun to watch yeah peak play peak players playing at their peak ability and players just making plays you know people winning a game because they go out and take it not because someone made a huge mistake and blew the game you know uh, th- that's that seems to be the common thread in a lot of these really legendary games that we do. 
Um, but we're one nothing right now, Ben, heading into the third period. Rangers are on top. And right off the bat, there's a two-on-one break that if the Rangers cash in on this goal, the end of this game may be different. But just a huge save by Brodeur on um, Sergei Nemchinov. Um, another memorable name from this Rangers team. Yeah. And uh, the Devils, I-, I thought the Devils played very well in the thir- the whole third period. Mm-hmm. And, again, the- you brought up Richter before. This is where Richter played really well at the beginning, midpoint of the third period. Yeah, he played outstanding. And it- when that when that first goal happened, too, it was one of those where you're just like, man, that, that one goal feels like it's probably going to be enough. I mean, with the way things were going – it just seemed like, man, it's going to be really tough to score on, on Richter right now. He, he's just he's he's a, a wall in front of that goal, and it was that way almost throughout. The Devils did get their first power play, could not capitalize on it in this period. But you know, this thing's all building to a one nothing victory, Mike. I mean, I, you could just sense it from the crowd. It was it was loud. It was raucous. I mean, it was it was peaking for that end of game. Third period's over. We're going to the Stanley Cup Finals. In the ending of this game, I, I still can't believe how late they scored, not remembering how it, like how this thing unfolded, because it just seems like a the time is running down pretty quickly, and they're not getting a ton of opportunities. They're getting some, but for the most part, you know the, the Rangers are doing what they need to do in terms of clearing the puck out and whatnot. But just somehow that puck stays in just long enough, and they find a way to score with 7.7 seconds left dude i can that is the craziest ending and i cannot imagine what it was like as a rangers fan all right ben a couple things here all right this is let let, let me uh, let me let loose here a little bit <laughs> first of all they show the trophy the eastern conference championship trophy god knows what it's called i don't know what it's called sorry hockey oh, fans gonna, yeah they're going to eat you up on that at 111 left they show the guy polishing the trophy so we've already touched the money here okay that's number one. So 54 years. Can we just wait till it happens to show us the trophy, please? <laughs> they show the graphic, a graphic with 16 seconds left that Richter hasn't let up a goal in 102 minutes. Yeah. Again, can we just let it happen here? It's 16 seconds left. I'll never forget the name Valerie Zelopukin for this reason. He scores a goal with 7.7 seconds left. Another crazy stat. The Devils went on a from on a span in the third period and the upcoming overtime, where in 15 minutes and 15 seconds they only had two shots on goal, and one of them was the goal by Zelipukin. Wow, that's crazy! It felt like they had more. Yeah, it. it, it I can't tell you, Ben. Is there certain, as as a sports fan, I think you remember a couple. Uh, you remember like when your team does something really good, mm-hmm. and you remember when you were in just total shock watching a game. Yeah, this was one of those moments where I was in total shock. I remember two moments I was in total shock during this playoff run was this. And then in the series against the Canucks, there was a very important penalty shot. And Pavel Bure was the one taking the penalty shot. Mm-hmm. Um, and Richter ended up stoning him, but still. It, that, that was a very shock, shocking kind of moment. Hmm. And this was right, This was even more shocking than that because it was like, what? Well, it's, it's, like, it's, it's, a, it's an all-time finish for a game in any sport. Right, a game seven goal with seven point seven seconds left on visiting ice. Right, I mean in Madison Square Garden, trying to break a curse. Could you imagine being like a seventy year old Rangers fan watching this? It uh, the other the other the other thing I noted too. You mentioned the broadcast, but this is around the time they also said, mm-hmm. you know, and it may have tied into that stat that they showed with Richter. But they were like, he he's he's trying to become the first. I think the first goaltender to have five shutouts in a playoff. I think they were like. Yep. They were hyping that up too, as his time was winding down too. But yeah, yeah, there was a lot of stoppages of play. Yeah, because of the icing calls that you mentioned before when they were clearing the zone. So that's when they showed the trophy. That's when they showed the graphic about not letting a goal in 102 minutes. That's when they mentioned about the shutouts, and it's like, oh god, just get these 16 seconds done. It's it, it had to be like being a Cubs, like, not as bad, but like being a Cubs fan when they've been so close. Even like when they won the World Series, when the game was that that tying homer. In that in the in the game they clinched was it game seven, that kind of moment where you, you feel like you're right there and then it's all ripped away. And when you go to overtime in hockey, I mean you know, it, it like it's it's completely up for grabs. I mean it just takes one mistake, the puck the puck bounces the wrong way and it's over. So any momentum you had, home ice is great, but it doesn't really matter in overtime hockey. It, it was sudden death. It's a different animal. Yeah, it's sudden death. It's random. 
You know, it's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. It could end, you know, it could end 20 seconds into the overtime period. Or like in this one, we could go a full overtime period with no goals. And that's what happened in this one. Both goalies played great. We had Bill Clement telling us to go get more beer because he didn't think the game was going to end for a <laughs> long time, which you would never hear today from an announcer. And we in the second, we head into the second overtime with both these goalies playing great. Yeah, we did. And, and you know, again, you're just kind of waiting for this thing to – to conclude, but this is the third double overtime game of this series, and it finally ends um, early in the second period. And as you heard at the beginning of this podcast, one of the great calls in New York history, right? And you have a better sense of this. Where, where does this call rank, Mike, in terms of all-time sports calls, regardless, hockey, baseball, basketball, whatever? So in my lifetime, this is the best call of a single like moment in a game ever it's not even really close right this you got to remember i know i've said this a million times but just to reiterate this is the only one of my professional teams i've ever seen win a world uh, win a championship right i was a little too young for the mets um but during this time i'm 12 13 years old you know so i completely know what's going on the ironic thing is howie rose obviously uh the voice of the rangers at this time on radio howie rose now the voice of the mets on radio but also the voice of the new york islanders so I think more people probably know him as an Islanders announcer now, but ironically enough, the call he's most known for is this call of the Stefan Matteau goal. Uh, Matteau also won a game in overtime in game two of this series, by the way. So uh, sort of an unheralded player for the Rangers, Stefan Matteau. And uh, just one of those calls you'll never forget. What's uh, I'll be, I'll be frank with you, Mike. Uh, Matteau is not a guy that I recognize name wise. Right now, what what's what's his legacy? I mean, is he is he a is he a New York like star? Because he didn't only play there a couple of years, right? He didn't have like he's not he's not a guy that played a whole career there or anything. No, he's not. I mean, his legacy is this goal. Okay, but <laughs> well, he's not both like a, goals. He, yeah, and he scored he scored another overtime goal to win in game two as well. But is um, he like on your list? Since this is the only championship you've seen on your list of like favorite New York athletes of all time, is he anywhere even on that list? No, he's not. Okay. I mean, you'll never I'm forget just trying his to get name. A sense. Okay. Yeah, no, he's not. But you'll never forget his name. One of those guys. Gotcha. Um, you know, it, it's uh, he was like a grinder kind of player. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Third, fourth line guy, grinded it out, played hard. One of those guys that all hockey teams need. Yeah, he played for six different teams over his career. So, just to give you a sense, I think the Rangers he played three years, and that was um, his second longest stop. So. Interesting enough, but yeah, this game finishes and, and that call with Matteo's goal and, and uh, the celebration that ensued and on the broadcast too, I give Gary Thorne a ton of credit. Like I don't, I, he laid out for probably like five minutes. Like there was not a word Pete from the broadcast. It was all fans. Yeah. And just so, just so we're clear like that, that Howie Rose call at the top of this was the Rangers broadcast. Right. I don't want to take anything away from Gary Thorne. He did a great job here too. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, that's the that's obviously what we watched for this for this uh, episode. He did do a very good job kind of laying out and uh, give ESPN credit. They didn't cut away from it. They didn't mm-hmm. go to like go to Sports Center with Keith Olbermann sitting there. You know what <laughs> I mean? Or whoever was on Sports Center back then. Uh, I'm talking about a guy who's changed a lot, but we're not going to get into that now. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, good job by the ESPN crew here. Uh, let's go through some outdated stuff, too, about this game. Like, the first thing that jumped out to me was the advertisements on the boards. That was pretty amazing. I mean, you, you have more of a connection as a, as a New York guy for some of the, the, the sponsors that were there. But, like, one of the ones that stood out to me was SeaWorld. <laughs> See, seeing SeaWorld on the boards was crazy to me. Yeah, there was national brands like SeaWorld, right? right? Then there was local New York brands like Models, which is a sporting goods store. I don't know if you know that. Mm-hmm. And Sabrette. Which is, do you have Sabret hot dogs? No. Did you ever hear of Sabret? No, no. Okay, no, no. that's a New York thing. Okay. Sabret hot dogs. Then you have old national brands of the day, like Apex. Mm-hmm. You had Nobody Beats the Wiz. Yeah. <laughs> which is a hugely popular store in the New York area. I don't know if, you know, ironically enough, Nobody Beats the Wiz, the Devils would become, the, uh, would become huge parts of Seinfeld, the show Seinfeld, which was huge at this time as well in the, mm-hmm. in the early mid 90s. Yeah, the, the putty episode was one the, year after this. Yep, the putty episode. <laughs> and then there's the – I wonder when the Nobody Beat the Wiz one was. Remember that one? Yeah, I don't know. I'm the it Wiz. Had to be, it had Nobody to be beats this, me. Yeah, it yeah. had to be around this time. Uh-huh. 
Uh, yeah, and then uh, obviously Snapple was also a, a sponsor, but Snapple. St- Snapple's still around, just not as uh, yeah, not as much of a powerhouse as it was back then. Yeah, I mean the other yeah that that was just that was amazing seeing those. The other thing too was like s- s- time and score again. We we pointed out a lot, but you know even even like in power plays, which we didn't have a lot in this in this game, but even during power plays, they'd only like flash up the power play time you know, a couple of times during it for a few seconds at a time. So, I mean, again, no sense of, of where we are in the game ever. Yeah, yeah. That, that never gets old talking about it either because it's so amazing every time we see it. This is probably the 10th or 15th game that we've had this happen in, and we talk about it every time like it's the first time it happened. You have to. I mean, because it's so difficult to watch a game. Like, if you, if you turn away at all and, like, or zone out or, like, you know, you start doing a little research while you're watching the game – like all of a sudden you're like, wait, where am I again? And you have no idea. Yeah, you're right. I couldn't put it any better. <laughs> um, what else outdated did you did you have from this game? Anything? No, I mean, I mean, you know, I guess it's outdated. Unfortunately, that it seemed like everyone that was at the game was interested in watching the game. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that's true. outdated, but that's outdated. Outdated from what I see at sporting events these days. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, what if wise. What what if what if the Rangers lose this game? I mean, that's kind of the main thing I think of is is what happens if they lose this game because this is the only they haven't won a cup since, right? No, yeah. I think you know that. You're just busting my stones here. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Like this to me, like the Rangers brand is really strong. But when you go over their history, they they I mean, they played in a lot of playoffs. They've had some successful seasons, but in terms of like actually winning stuff, it's like man, not a lot there. I mean, if they don't win this game, you know, Messier's legend is not what it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's a hugely popular New York athlete, Ben. Probably yeah. outside of Jeter, I can't think of many in my lifetime that have been more popular. Um, maybe Ewing, but again, they're both going through big playoff series this time, and Messier won a championship and Ewing didn't. So, right. I mean, it, it changes a lot. I mean, my, all these guys that are – I mean, does, does Leach win the Smythe? Probably not. You know, just all these guys is Richter and, and Rangers. You know, just you're, you're exactly right. I mean, this game sort of charted the. I mean, charted the path for a lot of these guys to become household names forever in the biggest media market in the world. You know, that's probably the best way to put it. Um, and had they not won, I don't know if that would have happened. On the other side too, the Devils. I mean, now the Devils won the following year, won the cup. They won um, three cups. Over the next ten years, essentially lost lost one. Um, how? What is this? And, and I get they're still thought of, they're thought really highly of from this this ten this decade long run. But if you have four Stanley Cups in, in ten years, I mean, does it change the way we perceive the Devils at all? I mean, is is this one of the great dynasties ever? I mean, or is it still? Hey, they're a really good team, but you know, still kind of a second fiddle. You know what's amazing is the Rangers have had. Two of the team, the two other teams they share a city with, or an, a metropolitan area with. The Devil, the Islanders won four cups late seventies, early eighties. The Devils win the four in ten years, like you mentioned, and the Rangers are still the most popular team, which yeah. is crazy when you think about it. Yeah. But I'll, I'll put it this way with the Devils, okay? In my lifetime watching New York area sports, right? Lamarillo, Lou Lamarillo, is by far the best executive ever. It's not even close. He's on like his own tier as far as being an executive in the New York area, like a GM is what I mean, basically. Mm-hmm. GM, team president, whatever. Yeah. And Brodeur, I think you can make the argument in my lifetime for his sport, I think he's the second best New York area athlete ever. And if he was walking down the street today, I bet you five out of ten people wouldn't recognize him if he was walking down the street in Manhattan. In Manhattan, too. Wow. Yeah, or even in New Jersey. Or in, uh, you know. <laughs> Hoboken. In uh, <laughs> Jersey City. Yeah, wherever, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, it just it yeah. just shows you how off the radar the Devils are because, like you said, four four cups in ten years is crazy. That is wild. That is wild. But incredible franchise, and yeah, we, Brodeur would become one of the 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 best ever. But that's pretty interesting that you you would call him the second greatest New York athlete. I mean, I I'm not not arguing with you. I just hadn't really thought of it that way. You yeah, I mean, I, I'm talking about guys who like played their career in New York, played their whole career in New York, most of if not their whole career in New York. I'm not talking about guys who are here. Played good elsewhere and came here. Um, the only two I can think of are Jeter and, and maybe Ewing. But again, it's a big mark on Ewing not winning a championship. Mariano, 
Yeah, I don't know. It's a reliever. You don't. You don't. I don't put closers in that guy. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I res- Rivera's great, but yeah, yeah. Not not as was like not not David Wright and Jose Reyes. Let's put it that way. Mike Piazza. Yeah, no, Piazza wasn't. He wasn't. No. Yeah, Brodeur was a goalie forever. Yeah, no, he was great. You know? man. he was awesome. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. But yeah, this is a this was a fun game to go back and watch, Mike. It's pretty cool hearing your perspective on it because you obviously lived it. This is your childhood right here, and um, it was. And I've heard all about this game, and I'm I'm pretty sure I watched it. I mean, I, I probably did uh, as a young sports fan. Probably at least had it on or something. But definitely don't remember how it all played out. And uh, pretty pretty wild to go back and watch it because the ending still is it's still hard to believe how that 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 game ended, but the Rangers still found a way to pull it off. Yep, exactly. It's just a great game. And if you want some laughs, go watch the Seinfeld episode with Putty, who's also ah. the only – he's like the only New Jersey Devils fan I think I know. You're um, going to hell. <laughs> and <laughs> ep- season six, episode 23, The Face Painter. The face is that episode if you want to check it out. Tremendous. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Distant Replay. We appreciate you listening. Like, subscribe, uh, follow, leave a comment, leave a review. All that stuff helps us out a lot. If you have a game that you want us to put on the list – Please let us know about that as well. We'll do that. True crime. We're doing documentary recaps as well. Three shows a week. So please hit subscribe so you won't miss a single episode. Yeah, as always, we, we really appreciate all the support. And until next time.